Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 86 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Bob Miller, and the topic of the show is Lyme Genomics Update. I had Bob Miller on the show on episode 44. If you'd like to hear his full bio, you can find it there. Today, I'm excited to have Bob back on the show to talk about his work with Lyme disease beyond phases one through three, which we covered in episode number 44. Today, we will focus on phases four, five, and six, and preview phase seven of his work around genetic patterns in those with chronic health challenges such as Lyme disease. Bob's research has been enlightening all of us in terms of new ways to support those of us that have been impacted by Lyme disease and other chronic illnesses. And now my interview with Dr. Bob Miller. We did our first podcast together in September of 2017. It's hard to believe that it's been that long. We've actually met a couple of times in person since then, and now we're going to get an update from Bob Miller today on what he's been working on for the past year since our initial conversation. Thanks so much for being here today again, Bob. Always a pleasure. And I must say, Scott, of all the people who do interviews, uh, you are the most prepared and, and most knowledgeable. So hats off to you for doing phenomenal work. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks so much. So let's start with a quick review of what we discussed in episode 44, which was your phases one through three. So I'm going to throw out each of the phases and maybe you can do just a short summary on each of those phases, what you found were issues and some of the things maybe that are helpful for your clients in terms of supporting them. And then people can go back and listen to episode 44 to get all the detail. But I want to just jump into, let's start with phase one, which is the iron overabsorption and the hydroxyl radicals. So talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Let me first mention that uh, we have to understand that this is not, this is a genetic pattern that means you have Lyme. These are genetic patterns that epigenetically set you up. You know, as we all know, genetic weakness when combined with epigenetic factors is what causes us to be toxic, weakens our immune system makes us not only susceptible to to Lyme, but to mold, to virus, and to bacteria. So when we say we've done a Lyme study, you know, this is not like the gene that sets you up for breast cancer. These are not the genes that set you up for dementia. These are genetic patterns that potentially make you toxic, where epigenetics and genetic weakness combine together to make you toxic in a weakened immune system. So when that pathogen gen comes along, you're less susceptible to fight it off. As we all know, some people are bit by ticks, nothing happens. Some people are bit by ticks, they do one round of antibiotics, and they're fine. And other people struggle for years. Those are the ones we studied, the ones we looked at, those non-responders, trying to find out, almost from a naturopathic standpoint, why is their terrain off, and then what is the genetic pattern that leads to that. So I just want to be clear, we're not finding the, the Lyme disease gene. Uh, I think what we found in our Lyme studies is the same things you'll find in Epstein-Barr, chronic fatigue, mold sensitivity, multiple chemical sensitivity, where we have genetic weakness leads to toxicity and leads us to be more susceptible, that the internal milieu or terrain is thrown off. So I just want to say that first, that we're not talking about, oh, this is the gene that leads to to Lyme disease. Very good. So first, uh, a little bit of the history as to how this happened. Uh, I spoke at a Lyme conference, and of course, when that happens, you know, people come to you and say, you know, perhaps you can help. And back in those days, we were just doing some simple methylations things. And people started streaming in, and then, of course, due to social media, more people started, you know, coming in to to speak to me. And what we do is we do uh, a genetic analysis. We look at uh, tens of thousands of SNPs to see, you know, if there are any genetic factors that could lead some to be more susceptible. And one of the things I kept seeing over and over was that there's a, there's a gene called HFE. And what that does when it's variated causes you to be likely to absorb a little bit more iron. 
And you'll notice I use the word likely and potential. If I ever say anything that I don't use the precursor likely or potential, plug that in because genetics is always just potential. So we saw this over and over, this HFE genetic variant showing up. What we meant by that is that these people likely absorb more iron from their diet. Then there's an organization called uh, ILADS, that's the Lyme Disease Association. We saw they had a, a call for abstracts of, of research. So we thought, well, why don't we do that? So we put a call out and we got several hundred people with what's considered chronic Lyme, submitted their, back then it was 23andMe data, and we started looking at their, their patterns. And we found they had a significantly higher amount of genetic variants in the genes that would cause you to overabsorb iron. And then we submitted that and we presented in Helsinki, Finland. And much to my surprise, uh, we actually were the poster winner at the Helsinki, Finland uh, International Conference on, uh, on Lyme disease. And, and all that is really just that, you know, maybe 10 or 12 people submit a poster, they pick the best one. So, but it was recognized as one that, uh, you know, was uh, significant. Now, what we found is that when we absorb more iron, uh, some things can happen with it. Normally, you know, we think of iron as being needed to make your hemoglobin. Well, of course it is. Iron's a critical nutrient for health. If you don't have enough iron, you're going to be in trouble. But iron is a double-edged sword. Uh, if it is used properly, it's helpful. If it is not chaperoned properly, it can be one of the nastiest free radicals. Now, what happens inside our body is we sometimes make a free radical called a superoxide free radical. And that's just when a, you know, an electron combines with oxygen, we get a superoxide free radical. Then our body, in all its wisdom, says, I've got to deal with this. And it has an antioxidant called superoxide dismutase. And maybe just in case someone's you know, not up on free radicals, we ought to just explain that quickly. As we all know, we have, you know, everything's made out of atoms, which is a neutron and a proton in the center the electron that spins. Electrically, that has to be balanced. If one of those electrons gets ripped off, we have a what's called free radical. It doesn't like being that way. And it will, if need be, just steal one from its neighbor and create this inflammatory process. Antioxidants have a spare electron, and they donate to that free radical to neutralize it so that it doesn't do damage. Some of the major ones are, you know, glutathione, catalase, superoxide, dismutase, thriodoxin. So back to this superoxide. The superoxide is neutralized by superoxide dismutase. And that makes something called hydrogen peroxide. Chemically, that's H2O2. And then we need catalase, glutathione, and thriodoxin to turn that into water. If that doesn't happen that iron molecule will combine with that hydrogen peroxide to make something called a hydroxyl radical. One nasty son of a gun who just creates inflammation, possibly will make another free radical called peroxynitrite. And this process is called the Fenton reaction, discovered by Dr. Fenton in 1895, where iron and hydrogen peroxide creates these hydroxyl radicals. We've been talking about these for years, and I was uh, rather surprised. Uh, one of my uh, res uh, research uh, board members sent me an article that was published just October of this year, 2018. And at a university, and this is published in a prestigious uh, journal, uh, not just somebody blogging on the internet, and they were saying that in every type of cancer they looked at inside the cell, they saw the Fenton reaction occurring, disrupting the pH. So clearly, I think the, the Fenton reaction occurring is something we have to take seriously. Why that article didn't become top news in the newspapers and, uh, and media is beyond me. I mean, that's, somebody should be shouting that from the rooftops, that this prestigious study showed that iron dysregulation you know, is a factor in uh, every cancer that they looked at by disrupting the pH inside the cell. So when people have blood tests that are done that potentially show iron deficiency and their practitioner puts them on supplemental iron, is it possible that we're in those people that have these HFE variants that we're making the situation worse rather than better? Sure. Now, clearly there are people, you know, blood loss or other issues where iron is life-saving, you know, no doubt. Uh, 
But on the other hand, one of the things that we're observing and one of the things we want to continue to study and, and research is that the most common thing I see in those people with chronic Lyme, and this also applies to multiple chemical sensitivity and extreme fatigue and all kinds of inflammatory conditions, is that they're often absorbing extra iron. And then due to other genetic or epigenetic factors, they don't clear the hydrogen peroxide. They collide and they make these hydroxyl radicals. And then consequently, your iron can be chewed up. And these people can be, uh, by, uh, by blood standards, anemic. And, you know, the the well-meaning uh, health professional says, oh, you're anemic, you need iron. Now, sometimes the iron is helpful, but when this is going on, the iron actually makes more inflammation and makes them worse. Now, the solution isn't to let them be anemic, but we're finding the solution is to help the body clear that hydrogen peroxide so that the iron can be used properly, not turning into hydroxyl radicals. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was that everything that we're talking about when we look at genes is potential. At what point do you think that we'll move beyond potential and be able to identify when certain genes are actually expressed in the body and causing a functional issue? Sure. I mean, this is all brand new. I mean, a lot of the research that's being done at universities is all related to genetic patterns. So we are in our infancy. Now, here at the Nutrigenic Research Institute, we're hoping we can be part of that research. Uh, I'm working with some functional medicine doctors to look at labs that we might be able to add to it. We will be able to see when this genetic pattern happens is is represented in the uh, you know actually in labs that uh, can be measured. Now, as you know, we we created software for health professionals only, not for the public, and we do look at the genetics, the labs, and the symptoms. And this is you know part of our ongoing research. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, if you see somebody who has the genes that would mean they overabsorb iron and they're anemic, uh, there's a very good potential that that's what's occurring. So what you can do then is, you know, support the removal of hydrogen peroxide, support glutathione creation and recycling. And I want to talk about in our last study, the one we just did, uh, there's genetic patterns that can actually mean that you don't uh, even take your iron and turn it into ferritin, the storage, further creating more oxidative stress. And then many times, you know, just observationally, we see people getting significantly better, their hemoglobin coming up, their inflammation going down as we support the proper use of iron. But lots to learn. And I sure hope that uh, the Nutrigenic Research Institute can, you know, possibly team up with some universities or or other offices to, you know, to do some uh, serious clinical trials. We're just in the early stages of discovering these things. So that was Bob Miller's short summary of phase one. So now, we're gonna... <laughs> I love it. It's great. So now let's talk about phase two and the glutamate to GABA conversion, the problems that happen there and what that results in. Sure, sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, we became interested in very early, and, and phase one alluded to this uh, a little bit as well, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a neurotransmitter called glutamate, and it's very fascinating. Uh, it uh, does multiple things. Glutamate is what makes you intelligent, makes you highly motivated, makes you a go-getter, getter-done kind of person. I have a sneaking suspicion uh, you are one of those people, Scott. <laughs> uh, based, yeah, based upon your, uh, your and, and somebody else on this call is somewhat similar as well. So... Uh, glutamate is what does all those things for you. But again, uh, it's all about balance. If glutamate is too high, it can create anxiety uh, and it can also create inflammation. Uh, we may talk about this more in our, in our, uh, the sixth study that we just presented in Chicago, but we found there's an enzyme called NOx, NADPH oxidase. And we'll get more into that. When we talk about study number six. But glutamate stimulates that to make inflammation. So I just wanted to throw that out and then we'll circle back to it. Now, glutamate uh, will also, you know, make it difficult to sleep. And also people with high glutamate, oftentimes out of the corner of their eye, they think they see a shadow or a person or an animal. And if it gets too high, that's where people start having visual hallucinations or even audio hallucinations. Now that's more rare, but that's what glutamate can do. Now, our bodies are very interesting. We need to take some of our glutamate and turn it into GABA. Now, GABA is the 
don't worry, be happy, chill out, you know, take a nap. <laughs> and we need that, that balance. So for example, if you do not convert glutamate to GABA, you just can't sleep. You're anxious all the time. Your mind can be racing so quickly that it's hard to focus. Uh, or sometimes some of the most gifted people uh, that, uh, that really have minds like computers and are doing amazing things have high glutamate. Now, interestingly, there's an enzyme called GAD. And GAD is what takes your glutamate and turns it into GABA. Interestingly, infection and inflammation inhibits the glutamate to GABA conversion. So when you get any infectious disease like Lyme, that's when somebody who maybe has high glutamate to begin with, who's highly intelligent, that's why many times I believe people with Lyme disease start getting very anxious because the infection inhibits the glutamate to GABA conversion. And then as, as glutamate creates inflammation, that inflammation further blocks the glutamate to GABA. Now, interestingly, glutamine, which is an amino acid, turns into glutamate, but also glutamate turns back into glutamine. Now, I think everyone knows about the very important uh, antioxidant called glutathione, the master antioxidant. And acetylcysteine, glycine, glutamine are the ingredients to make glutathione. And that's why some people take NAC, and we can talk about that later, why that that acetylcysteine can be helpful or harmful. But glutamate actually has to turn back into glutamate. Well, interestingly, inflammation inhibits the glutamate to glutamine conversion. So now you're getting more glutamate and you're not turning it into glutamine to make your antioxidant glutathione, which further ramps up the inflammation. And is it then true that people that are taking supplemental glutamine for intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut potentially are increasing their glutamate? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, many holistic health practitioners see people that have leaky gut or they have gut issues. And it's like, well, let's give you some glutamine to heal the gut. Now, the reason glutamine is so helpful is because it stimulates something called mTOR that we'll talk about in our next study. But mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin, the growth of new cells. Folate, glutamine, iron, amino acids, all of those stimulate mTOR, which is an important thing, but we'll, we'll talk about in our next study that we have to make sure we don't have an imbalance be between those. So what happens then is that when you take too much glutamine, we don't know for sure, but the body may say, okay, I have to turn some of this glutamate into glutamine, but I already have enough. Or some of that glutamine may turn into glutamate. So uh, here again, I think, you know, we can have well-meaning intentions to heal the gut, but it's all about balance. We can have too much or too little of anything. And I do get concerned that sometimes some of these gut healing protocols might be giving some individuals too much glutamate. So uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of pulsing things. So if someone does need Glutamine, I've become a fan of, well, let's not do it every day. You know, we, we tend to think if a little is good for us, a lot must be really good. So we're doing a lot of research on pulsing. That is a quote that I've heard many times from another mentor of mine, Dr. Neil Nathan. If some is good, more is not necessarily better. Right. <laughs> so, so let's exactly. talk then about phase three, uh, keep one, NRF2, mTOR, and autophagy. What are some sure. of the key things? But before that we do that, I have one more sure. thing on glutamate. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. okay. So there's a third pathway for glutamate, and that is that it can go down and make alpha ketoglutarite and succinyl COA, which is energy inside the cells. And the cofactor for that is something called NAD+, and we'll talk about that at the very end, but that is oftentimes being depleted. So our glutamate now doesn't go through that pathway. And stay tuned, because when we talk about the sixth study, we're gonna talk about how disruptions in the heme pathway can actually create GABA blockers. In other words, blockers to the GABA receptor site. So not only do you not turn your glutamate into GABA, but you can also have your GABA receptor site block that we'll talk about later, but that's also part of energy. So in that study, when we showed all the different ways that glutamate can be impaired, uh, I think that's one we have to look at 
bacteria seriously. And we need to look at ways to reduce the inflammation so the glutamate can turn into GABA. And I'm a huge fan of an herb called Hinocchio that comes from magnolia bark. Mm -hmm. It does support the glutamate to GABA conversion. So, uh, but I just wanted to get that uh, third piece in before we moved on. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I'm learning, learning new things, loving it. So phase three, keep one, NRF2, mTOR, and autophagy. What were the key takeaways that you learned from that study? Sure. Well, this is one of the one we presented in, uh, in Paris. And let's, you know, let's go back to the, to the naturopathic philosophy the internal milieu. It's a balance between inflammation and antioxidants. So inflammation, by the way, one of my favorite sayings is uh, recently is, you know, there, there's no demons and saviors in, in regards to antioxidants and free radicals. We, we tend to think of free radicals as bad and antioxidants as good. However, some free radicals are needed to actually kill pathogens. So superoxide and hydrogen peroxide aren't all bad. There are times that they're useful for us. It's when they become an excess that they become a problem. Again, it all goes back to the bell curve. Too little or too much of anything is a problem. And taking what you just said one step further, too many antioxidants do have the potential to be bad. Absolutely, yeah. because you do need some free radicals to fight the pathogens. So we, we tend to look at things in black and white, and I'm looking more at bell curve all the time. That you know, too little iron, you've got a problem. Too much iron, you have a problem. Too little glutamate, you have no idea what you're doing. Too much glutamate, you're in an anxiety inflamed state. So it's all about this balance. There's a bell curve, too little or too much of just about everything. You know, the Chinese spoke about that with the yin and the yang, and they need to be balanced. We can, you know, talk about oxygen. You know, if you don't get oxygen, you've got about three minutes breathe pure oxygen, you're dead in two or three days. Without water, you've got a couple of days, drink four gallons a day, you wash out your electrolytes and your heart stops. So there's this balance to just about everything. And a lot of epigenetic factors we're being exposed to today are putting us out of balance. Okay, NERF2, nuclear transaction factor, uh, NRF2. When, when we look at, when I show my clients the, the charts, it's amazing what NERF2 does. NERF2 is responsible for controlling the genes that make, utilize, and recycle glutathione. They're also responsible for making something called NADPH that we'll talk about later. That's what recharges your antioxidants. Because when, when your antioxidant gives an electron, it needs to be recharged. NADPH recharges that. Thriodoxin is another enzyme that's used an antioxidant that removes the hydrogen peroxide. NERF2 controls that. And fascinatingly, NERF2 is even responsible for the proper use of iron and iron sequestration. So when you think about if iron can become this free radical and glutathione and thriodoxin and NADPH are the ones that control it, NERF2 is master control for all of those. So we found, you know, not surprisingly, than those who had the chronic Lyme had more genetic variants in their NERF2. Now, I like to give the analogy, think of NERF2 as a sprinkler in the, in the ceiling. And think of, uh, I'm sorry, think of uh, NERF2 as the water uh, in behind the sprinkler and keep one as the sprinkler. And when there's a fire that comes along, keep one releases the water. It's kind of a crude analogy, but somewhat there. So when you've got genetic variants in the NERF2, it's kind of like a sprinkler system that doesn't have water. And the KEEP1, what holds on to NERF2 and releases it with oxidative stress, if you have variants there, it's like a fire comes along and the sprinkler says, what fire? So the free radicals can just have free reign because your body's not giving off the antioxidants. Now, the other thing we found in that same study, there was more genetic variants in an enzyme called SL, or a gene called SLC40A1 that makes something called ferroportin. Most people probably never heard of ferroportin. It's the only enzyme that takes iron out of the cell. So we take iron in, but we also need to export it as well. So one of the things we're observing, and again, just clinically observing, when people have the HFE genes that cause them to absorb more iron, then they have the SLC48 ones that they don't take the iron out. These are the folks that are 
mid thirties, early forties, inflamed as can be, and nobody can seem to figure out what's going on. Just massive inflammation throughout the entire body. You know, they've been to 15 clinics and nobody can seem to crack the code. That's what we are observing in many of those people. Overabsorption of the iron, not carry it out. And then, you know, why don't we on top of that add nerve two weakness so that you can't make your antioxidants. Now, in that study, uh, we got to admit there was a, a gene came up because we just looked at, you know, thousands of them. And what we do, Scott, is we, we compare that hunt, those couple hundred people with Lyme to what's called the thousand genome project, which is a thousand randomly chosen, relatively healthy people. And we look at, you know, where are there more, you know, which genes are more genetically variated than those with chronic Lyme. And one came up called mTOR. And I got to admit, when I saw mTOR, I said to my staff, so what the heck is mTOR? <laughs> what is this? So we started uh, digging into it. And of course, I was fascinated. It has a long name that uh, really doesn't make any sense, but it stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. And that is the growth of new cells. So I like to tell my clients that mTOR, if we didn't have mTOR, the sperm and the egg would never become the baby. The baby never become the adult. And as we as adults would never make new cells. So mTOR is important. It's the growth of new cells. I tell people this is kind of like the construction crew. It's what makes new cells. Pretty darn important. If we didn't have it. Life wouldn't exist. However, we need to also do some cleaning. And there's a process called autophagy. A-U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y. Autophagy is the cleaning of the cells. I give the analogy, think of autophagy as the janitors. They're the ones who do the cleanup. So as everyone knows, your cells are constantly dividing. And every seven years, we're just about completely turned over. Those old cells have to be reabsorbed and recycled. I'm in farming country, so I like to tell my clients, at the end of the year, the farmer plows the crop under, it rots, ferments, and actually becomes fuel for the spring crop. In a sense, our cells do that as well. Autophagy is that process, but it also takes out mold and virus and bacteria and other things. So what we found then in the, as we then moved to our, to our next study that we presented in, uh, in Boston uh, in 2017 was that there was more genetic variants in things that would upregulate mTOR and downregulate autophagy in those with chronic Lyme. Uh, if you Google the word autophagy and Nobel Prize, you'll see in 2016, the Nobel Prize in medicine was given to a Japanese researcher who did research on autophagy. And anyone who's into a holistic health, you're constantly hearing about intermittent fasting. You're hearing about the ketogenic diet. And the reason that's becoming so popular is because when we're eating, we are stimulating mTOR. Now, when mTOR is stimulated, it tells the janitors, we're at work, take a break, come back later. So when we do intermittent fasting or we do the ketogenic diet, we're reducing the pressure on mTOR and we're allowing autophagy to do its job. So that's why you're seeing some people who do tremendously well, for example, picking eight hours during the day that you eat, 16 that you don't, or a day here and there that you stop eating. And the ketogenic diet, quite simply, is high fat, low carb, low protein. Carbs and proteins stimulate mTOR. So we have a whole chart. And if anyone you know, looks at our charts, you'll see the, the chart that we presented in, uh, in Boston. We, we spoke at the, at the ILADS conference where we showed how there are genetic patterns that allows people to have upregulated mTOR and downregulated autophagy in chronic Lyme. And we'll talk about in the last study why some people on some some people are probably saying, "Hey, I've tried keto and I've tried intermittent fasting, and I did horrible." We'll talk about why that works for some people and doesn't work for others. So we will um, add in the show notes the links to each of the different um, posters mm -hmm. that 
Bob's talking about here relative to each of the phases and the studies that they've done. So you can look at those in much more detail. Before we jump into phase four, a few questions that I've heard come up from people after the prior podcast that I wanted to just get your thoughts on. So um, in phase one, we talked about the hydroxyl radical production. I know hydrogen water is potentially one of the things that can be helpful in that scenario. Mm -hmm. I've also heard people that have said, yeah, I tried the hydrogen water and I got really, really sick. So what makes someone not tolerate hydrogen water potentially? Sure. What we're observing in our office is if somebody has SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, uh, the hydrogen does not do well with that. So uh, uh, I sometimes if I suspect people have it, I'll say, tell you what, let me just give you one or two tablets. And anybody doesn't know, they're just little tablets that you drop in a glass of water or bottle of water. It fizzes and it's about as simple as you can get. Water is H2O and it knocks some of the hydrogen loose. So a hydroxyl radical is OH minus, OH minus plus H2 equals water. And it is one of the, I, I, I tell people there's no fountain of youth, but this probably gets about as close as you're going to get. Uh, because it does neutralize those hydroxyl radicals. Uh, I had the, the very good advantage of uh, meeting uh, this past summer with uh, you know, some of the experts in hydrogen water, and they're now believing that it also turns on some of the antioxidants in addition to possibly having that. And hydrogen water appears to enhance the effects of any nutrient taken with it. So, But I think that's why some people do poorly. Uh, I'm sure it's not every time. But if someone feels very poorly, particularly gassy, bloaty, uh, you know, distension, uh, then I would talk to your health professional about, is there a SIBO going on? And, uh, you know, does that have to be remedied first before the hydrogen would be effective? You mentioned intermittent fasting, eating eight hours a day, not eating 16 hours a day, kind of getting into a rhythm there in terms of having potentially the mTOR side and then the autophagy when we're not consuming food. In terms of supplementation throughout the course of a day or a week, have you drawn any further conclusions about what the right rhythm might be in terms of when to support mTOR versus autophagy, for example? Sure. Yeah, we're, uh, we're really experimenting with that. And uh, we're, we're looking at supporting mTOR maybe two to three days a week, and then supporting autophagy two to three days a week. Uh, part of our research is showing that, that the, uh, the NERF2 and autophagy seem to go together. So if we're doing any nutrients to support NERF2, we'll do that with autophagy. But we don't do anything that supports mTOR and autophagy at the same time. You're kind of working against each other. Now, one of the great questions is, you know, circadian rhythms, and this is an area we'd like to research. And this is truly a question, not a statement. You know, is it to your advantage to support mTOR in the morning and then after the last meal of the day support autophagy? So is this a 24-hour cycle or should we do mTOR for a couple of days, autophagy for a couple of days? I certainly don't know and I don't think anybody else knows here. And no, I suspect the answer will be that it's probably different for each individual. And, and that's interesting because even in the pro-oxidant versus antioxidant type things, I've heard Dr. Klinghart talk about that as well, that you really want to do the pro-oxidative things earlier in the day and the antioxidants later in the day, and that there's kind of a natural cycle. So that's, that's really cool to see that continuing to evolve. You mentioned that autophagy, when we have impairments in autophagy, that that potentially um, is correlated to those with exposure to mold and water damage buildings. So um, does then supporting autophagy seem to improve people's health when they are getting or have had exposure to mold and mycotoxins? Again, just observing in our office, just our clinical observations, uh, dramatic improvements in sensitivity to mold, chemicals, and other things when we support the autophagy. And there's, there's three ways to support autophagy. You know, one is the caloric restriction. Uh, second is the ketogenic diet where, and the reason the ketogenic diet works is because amino acids and carbohydrates strongly encourage uh, mTOR activity where fats are not as strong and you're getting into ketosis. And I'm sure you've probably done some podcasts on that that explain all of that. Uh, but then the third is what are called the caloric aminics. Interestingly, turmeric and resveratrol inhibit mTOR. And berberin and lithium support autophagy. So it's interesting that, you know, we, we've known about turmeric forever, you know, that it's uh, 
that it's anti-inflammatory. And we'll talk about how it also inhibits uh, what's called the NOx enzyme when we get to that. And we've known resveratrol's benefits, but we now know why they're helpful. I, I find it so fascinating that, you know, we've historically known things are helpful. I mean, we've known this for a long time before we did the studies. And, and now genetics and biochemistry study is showing how they work and, and why they work. And, and now we can even, uh, you know, fine tune it even more. For example, skullcap has been used as an anti-inflammatory. It may have other properties, but one of the things it does is slows down iron absorption. So now we can decide, you know, perhaps with a little more precision when to use things. So I will use skull cap formulas if I believe there is inflammation related to the hydroxyl radicals because of excess iron. We can use curcumin, turmeric if we believe there's upregulation of mTOR or upregulation of NOx1. So absolutely fascinating how science is now validating uh, the power of these plants. Uh, I don't think we begin to understand uh, the power of these plants, and this will continue to evolve as universities do study and, and watch how they impact uh, genetic function. And one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that you come, you share your knowledge. You're not really here to promote your products, but I do want to mention in this case, um, I think autophagy assist, right, is one of the products that you have formulated that can be helpful in supporting autophagy. So what was kind of going through my mind is, does it maybe make sense just to have one day a week where someone's water fasting, for example, and then also using autophagy assist and just incorporating that into their routine on a regular basis? Is that potentially one way to support autophagy. Sure. And we've actually, we're actually doing that. We are suggesting for some individuals, uh, if you're going to do intermittent fasting on just some days, or if you, you know, do complete water fasting on some days, that's when you do the autophagy assist. Mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, the balance also has to go between where you are age-wise and where you are health-wise. So if you're a, you know, 17, 18, 19 year old who wants to do some bodybuilding, well, you can probably do more mTOR than autophagy. If you're, you know, 40 years old and you've got mold sensitivity, maybe for a couple of weeks, you don't even want to support mTOR at all. Mm -hmm. And then maybe one or two days a week. And then as we move towards elderly and we're starting to lose muscle mass, perhaps a little more mTOR support is needed so that we don't lose the, the muscle strength. And we're actually doing some research on that of, you know, what is the proper way to alternate between the mTOR and the autophagy. And I don't know that we have the answers, but I'm fairly confident to say, I think we have to find the rhythm, not do mTOR support every day. And that's why, you know, bodybuilders who are so focused on bodybuilding and they do all these amino acids, you know, many times they have kidney failure by their late 40s, early 50s, because they've just driven mTOR so aggressively. So even something like, a, you know, a protein drink that we think is so good for us, overdoing it may overstimulate mTOR make us toxic and actually, you know, weaken the body by pushing it in too much direction. Again, all goes back to moderation and balance. So let's move on to phase four, which is a very popular topic over the last year or so, and that is the mast cell and histamine side of things. So given the studies that you've done with phase four, how important do you think mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance are from a clinical symptom presentation perspective? Is it a little player or a big player? Sure. Well, I'm, uh, I'm beginning to believe that overactivation of mast cells is much, much larger than we ever anticipated. Okay. And just for, for someone, if they're not familiar with it, mast cells are white blood cells that are really good guys. They are not the enemy. You know, uh, They're floating around in the body. And if you accidentally hit your thumb with a hammer, uh, your thumb is going to swell because these mast cells do what's called degranulate and, and they give off uh, heparin and cytokines and other things to create an inflammatory storm. So again, if you've got a virus or a bacteria or something, here is where inflammation becomes your friend. It's there to, to do a job. Now, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while and it's only in the last couple of years that I started hearing about mast cells. So the question becomes, well, well, why? You know, why all of a sudden are we seeing so many people with mast cell, uh, what's called mast cell activation? Now, there is a very serious illness that's diagnosable, but that's relatively rare. But there, I'm convinced a lot of people running around that their mast cells are a little overactive. Okay. And so what happens is that when, uh, when these mast cells are triggered, and actually this, you know, this, this kind of ties into our last study that we just presented, but 
we, we did in our other study and related to acetylation. I assume you're talking about the acetylation study, right? Okay. So what we what we found is that there's patterns that will cause these mast cells to to overfire, which is our study number six. But we, we kind of did in a backwards fashion. Six showed why there's overstimulation, but the one previous showed why there was uh, why there was uh, not calming down of the mast cells. So let's go back to what mast cells are. They're white blood cells that when they degranulate, they cause inflammation. Now, some of the symptoms are uh, you don't tolerate heat very well. You know, you get hot and it's like, man, I am really tired. Uh, you take a hot shower and you're filled with, uh, with rashes. Or you can maybe not tolerate cold very well. Uh, when it's extreme, even a massage is painful. So I talk to many people all the time and say, what do you think of massage? Oh, gosh. I hurt for days because even the pressure of the massage causes these mast cells to fire. And it's also, you know, individuals, if they just, you know, take their, their fingernail and they scratch their arm, they get these large red, you know, welts that are just way beyond because the mast cells are over firing or they get bit by a mosquito and all of a sudden they got this huge welt, not this little bump. And there's many other signs and symptoms of mast cells activating. Now, in typical fashion, you know, some people are thinking of, oh, bad mast cells. How do we calm them down? And as a traditional naturopath, my question becomes, why are they overfiring? You know, I look at them as like the military. And when there's a foreign invader, thank goodness for the military. But we don't want the military turning on the citizens. And I'm afraid what's happening is the military inside the body is turning on the citizens. You know, these are people that have a very red face all the time. Uh, or they get warm, they just get, you know, very, very red, uh, rashy, you know, histamine responses. So, so what I'm hearing you saying is the mast cell side of things creates a lot of the symptoms that we experience, but it itself is not the core issue, that there are these other triggers that we still need to identify and address while also supporting the mast cell stabilization and histamine intolerance side of things, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not saying we, we don't do things to knock down the mast cells, mm -hmm. but I believe we're doing a disservice if that's all we do. Mm -hmm. If we view the mast cells as, oh, they're bad, they need to be calmed down. Um, you know, it's kind of like a I, uh, I remember many years, an old, uh, an old adage was the reason we're never going to find a cure for the common cold because the common cold is the cure. The fever, the, the sneezing is the body's attempt to get rid of things. So when we just take things to knock down the fever, now, of course, if the fever gets too high, different story. But I mean, for the most part, the fever is the friend trying to kill the pathogens. The coughing, the sneezing is the body's way of trying to get rid of that you know, virus inside you. So, you know, is there a time that maybe the fever needs to be knocked down? Well, possibly. Is there a time that maybe an ad, a, uh, something to dry up the cold is necessary? But probably rarely. So the same way with all these things that, you know, take care of the histamine. Is that an answer to help take care of the, the symptoms, make you feel better? Yes. But do I think we need to go to the next level? And that is, why are they overfiring? And what are some of those, from your perspective, what are some of those triggers that lead to sure. our firing? Sure. Well, let's go back to what I just presented in, uh, in uh, Poland uh, this uh, June of uh, 2018. Uh, Warsaw, by the way, Warsaw is what a beautiful city that is. Uh, this is a nice place to visit. If anyone ever wants to take a vacation, I highly recommend Warsaw, Poland. But what we presented there was our, was our fifth study. And as we all know, we, we need to detox. So let's just go back to detox a little bit. Cytochrome P450 is involved with phase one detox where we take things out. Then that changes those molecules into something that has to be further detoxed by multiple detox mechanisms. Everybody talks about methylation. I think we spoke about that in our first interview. Is methylation important? You betcha. Uh, is under methylation an issue? You betcha. But it seems like we just focus on this methylation and we just stay stuck on that. There's acetylation. There is sulfation. I want to talk about the sulfation in our, in our sixth study. Uh, there's glucuronication. There's one that uses our amino acid. There's multiple uh, methods of phase two. I'm not going to do a shameless plug for an event we have coming up uh, early September 2019, uh, Denver, Colorado. And this is for health professionals only. We're going to be looking at all the genetic pathways of phase one 
and phase two. And we're hoping to have a giant map made up uh, that the practitioner can use that shows their phase one and phase two pathways. Now, what I want to go back to is what we presented in, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, Poland, and that is this acetylation. Absolutely fascinating. And just like methylation is the attachment of a methyl group to something to either turn it on or turn it off, acetylation is attaching acetyl group. And you just don't hear much about this. Okay. So there's a process inside the body when, as we all know, we have the Krebs cycle and our fats, carbohydrates, and proteins go through a process of making energy. First thing that's made is something called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is what's needed by the N-acetyltransferase gene to either turn some things on or turn them off. Interestingly, uh, acetylation is involved in clearing histamine. And then it's also involved, many people who don't acetylate properly have difficulty with, uh, with cigarette smoke or exhaust fumes. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody, but if cigarette smoke and exhaust fumes just really make you nauseous and you can barely stand it, there's a potential that your acetylation pathways are less than optimal. Could be all kinds of other things. But whenever I see genetic weakness in acetylation, 90% of the time I ask the folks, how do you deal with cigarette smoke and exhaust fumes? And they're like, oh my gosh, I can't take it. Somebody's smoking, I have to get out of the room. If I'm in traffic, I get sick from the exhaust fumes. Now, for acetylation to occur, uh, we need multiple things to get into that acetyl-CoA. But one, I believe one of the most important ones is pantothene, which is slightly different than pantothetic acid. And just like we have folic acid turning into methylfolate, we actually have to make pantothene. Well, interestingly, there's some genes called the PANC genes that are responsible for that. And again, observing, we see many people who have a lot of genetic variants in their PANC genes have those issues that seem to go along with acetylation. Now, to my knowledge, there's no, there's no blood test or any other testing, just observationally. But we do notice that when we put people on pantothene, many times uh, they get considerable improvements in, uh, in their whatever condition they have, particularly inflammatory. So are you suggesting then, so phase four was the mast cell piece, the histamine piece, phase five, um, the acetylation and lipid aspect of things. So are, are you suggesting then that the pantothene in some cases, because of its effect on acetylation, is helping people deal with their histamine intolerance? Absolutely, yes. When you, if, you look at that, uh, if you look at that chart that we presented, uh, you will see that, uh, you'll see down through the pathway where the acetylation, and there's, there's a couple of steps here to it, uh, is responsible for acetylating NERF2 and KEEP1 through the Krebs binding protein. And N-acetylcysteine, I'm sorry, not N-acetylcysteine, the N-acetyltransferase genes need the acetyl-CoA for part of phase two detox. So if your xenobiotics are not cleared, then they're more likely to create mast cells. And interestingly, acetylation and panathene also go down through what's called the steroidal pathway, where the end result is cortisol. And cortisol is also anti-inflammatory, and we found literature that cortisol will also inhibit histamine. So we're seeing all these people with these histamine issues, the spring and fall allergies and the rashes and all of these things, and there's multiple reasons for it. I mean, the mast cells give it off, so... That's why I often say this is the 3D chess game played underwater uh, because there's so many factors. If somebody says, I've found the issue, I tend to get very worried and run. Uh, but there's multiple factors. So does high histamine mean you have an acetylation problem? No. Could it be? Sure. Could it be one of the factors? Absolutely. Histamine can also be caused because you, uh, you don't make enough of the DAO enzyme that breaks down histamine foods. And if all you do is someone tells you you need to do kombucha and miso and, and start eating fermented foods, you can have one heck of a histamine problem from that. There's also a gene called HNMT, histamine N methyl transferase. It needs a methyl group to break down histamine. So if you have genetic variants in HNMT or you don't have the methyl groups, and here's where methylation comes important, you're not going to break down your histamine there either. So we can have the mast cells 
massively making all this histamine, overproducing it, or we can have things that we're allergic to that cause the histamine, uh, or we can have weakness in our acetylation. And acetylation is interesting because through the one process, we break down the histamine, and then through the other process, we make the cortisol that inhibits the inflammation that causes the histamine and also supports uh, the acetylation that takes some of the xenobiotics out that also contribute to the histamine. So again, this is multifactorial. When you look at the charts, you see lines going in all kinds of directions. Yeah, it definitely is a, an interesting web that we've weaved here. So would you agree that mold exposure in water damage buildings, viruses, bacteria, things like Bartonella, um, even electromagnetic fields is one that I've been reading about, that all of those things can be the triggers of the mast cell activation. And to your point, while we're potentially stabilizing the mast cells, potentially dealing with histamine intolerance, reducing histamine, we wanna make sure that the primary focus is addressing those triggers so that long-term we don't continue to stay in this activated cycle, correct? Absolutely. And you know, a lot of people say, well, we've had mold forever. Why is mold now becoming a problem? Well, in the past, I would speculate that our detox pathways had the ability to take care of the mold. Oh, here's a little mold. Okay, let's get rid of it. But our bucket is getting fuller and fuller and fuller because we don't know the implications of the EMF. Uh, I want to talk a little bit very soon about the NOx enzyme in ADPH oxidase, which creates the mast cells. That is stimulated by low-frequency EMF. It is stimulated by mold. It is stimulated by sulfites. It's stimulated by homocysteine. It's stimulated by high iron, and it's stimulated by mTOR. So you can just see how this tsunami is coming upon us. The perfect storm is upon us. So a couple more questions on the phase four mast cell piece before we jump on. Tell us a little bit about kit genes and how they affect mast cells and histamine intolerance. Sure. Um, we don't really, I don't know, we fully understand, you know, what happens when some of these genes get very good, but the kit genes do trigger the mast cells. And, uh, you know, Dr. Afrin has done a lot of work on this. So has uh, Dr. Thea Hardy's uh, credit to them for, the, for their research on this. And, uh, you know, when there are variants in the kit genes, it seems as though stimuli from these environmental factors makes the, uh, the mast cells trigger happy, as I like to call it. One of the observations that I've had is when people are unable to tolerate many different types of treatments that their practitioners might introduce, they seem to react to many things, that when you address this mast cell and histamine side of things, that it kind of opens up the toolbox a bit, that they're able to tolerate other things. Are you seeing that clinically as well? Oh, absolutely. But uh, uh, as they say, there's, there's more. There's more things here that are uh, creating the mast cells that we'll get into. Right. So tell us a little about your MC Balancer, which I know is one of the products you also formulated for mast cell activation, histamine intolerance. What are some of the key things that are in it that might be helpful for people dealing with mast cell issues? Sure. Well, there, there's a little bit of uh, luteolin in there. And uh, that's one of the bioflavonoids. And uh, I've just made a, a chart that interestingly shows uh, where luteolin comes in. Uh, you know, it's probably got multiple ways that it's supportive. But one of the things we found is that aldosterone stimulates an enzyme that stimulates the mast cells. And luteolin calms that down just a little bit. And, and we're continuing to, to research uh, all of those. And the other thing that we put in there, of course, was, uh, was curcumin. Uh, and there's a couple other ingredients as well. But primarily, uh, you know, again, we talked about curcumin calms down what's called the NOx enzyme that stimulates mast cells. And of course, curcumin also calms down the, uh, the mTOR. So it may have, and, and of course, you know, we really don't know, you know, when they do these studies in the universities, they see that, you know, mTOR gets downregulated when curcumin is, is given. Well, is that because it downregulated NOx and therefore there wasn't as much inflammation that stimulated mTOR? Or is it the other way around? It just calmed down mTOR that didn't stimulate NOx. So these are all the questions that will you know, probably be answered over the next couple of years. Another interesting thing that I read recently in this realm of mast cell activation and histamine issues is 
that air hunger can be a sign of mast cell activation as well. In the realm of chronic Lyme, we often jump to, oh, Babesia is probably the reason someone has an air hunger issue, but that's not necessarily the case that this whole mast cell and histamine piece can also present with a similar symptom, correct? Oh, absolutely. And I don't know that I could explain the mechanism, but mast cells, uh, you know, do uh, cause uh, vasoconstriction of the bronchial tubes. So there may even be an asthma component here as well. But, uh, and I think that's what creates, uh, that. that's probably one of the factors. You know, you can't say that is the factor. But mast cells seems to be a factor in causing the bronchial tubes to constrict, causing that uh, air hunger. The other thing that mast cells do, and I don't know that I understand the mechanism, it was sometimes called edema, cause edema in the lower legs. Mm. And I don't, I don't know the mechanism as to how it does it other than just speculating it may be involved with aldosterone that, uh, that causes you to excrete potassium and hold on to sodium, but I, don't, I haven't seen any papers on that. So let's then jump ahead now to phase five, which we've talked about a little bit already. So acetylation, lipid synthesis, you talked about pantothene. People are familiar with pantothenic acid, primarily a form of vitamin B5 that people often use for supporting the adrenals. So my understanding is then in some people that pantothenic acid or B5 can convert optimally to pantothene, but that some people with specific variants then are unable to convert to pantothene. So, so help me understand if that's a correct understanding, what genes are involved, and when we can't make that conversion to pantothene, what are some of the potential issues? Sure. Well, the, uh, the PANC genes, and there's four of them, and I don't think we fully understand all of them, kind of like MTHFR. But we've observed that when people have a lot of particularly homozygous PANC genes, they need pantothene. And a lot of people don't even know about it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. I, I know I've, uh, I spoke about this at uh, Dr. Klinghart's Limelight Conference, and he is now speaking uh, a bit about uh, pantothene uh, because it also feeds the adrenals. I mean, it, we've known a long time ago, I mean, 30 years ago, we were talking about pantothenic acid for the adrenals. And I think pantothene is even more effective because if you look at the steroidal pathway, pantothene is needed to combine with your cholesterol to go down through that pathway to make your pregnenolone, your DHEA, that then goes down into all your hormones through one pathway and your cortisone or your cortisol on the other pathway. You know, and many people uh, who are massively inflamed are low in cortisol. So that's, uh, so I see pantothene having so many advantages because it supports the production of the acetyl-CoA on the one hand, which then supports acetylation, which does a lot. And it also supports the, uh, the cortisol. So both of those pathways get impacted uh, when we take some, uh, some pantothene. So that's why I'm a, a huge fan of pantothene. I personally take it every day. I personally do as well. Um, and, and how it came to me initially was through Dr. Klinghart's work, which I know he picked up some from your lecture as well. Um, so my understanding is that the reason he's primarily using it in his program is that the acetylation side of things can help with silencing of viruses and potentially these endogenous retroviruses as well. And so using it to help the body be able to silence some of these viruses that are starting to uh, become active within us as a result of EMFs and environmental toxicity. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, we, uh, we sometimes talk about things having uh, side effects. The nice thing about nutrition is you get side benefits. And <laughs> <laughs> like in addition that. to that, it does this as well. So. so have you seen any downsides or side effects with pantothene clinically? I've never seen anyone have a negative effect with pantothene. Okay, beautiful. So talk to us then a little bit about this whole acetylation. How is acetylation involved in detoxification? And what is the connection from acetylation to our production of hormones within the body? Sure. Well, the, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, the chart, you'll see that the, uh, the acetylation process or the ACAT uh, is directly in line of the steroidal pathway. So that's right at the top of the steroidal pathway. And then from a detox standpoint, again, acetylation is one of the detox pathways that's, uh, that's needed uh, to clear toxins. And, you know, there's a lot of people, we, we tend to think of, uh, you know, people being depressed with low serotonin, but you can have difficulties with serotonin storm as well. Again, everything's in balance. So if you're not acetylating, there's potential that your serotonin is not cleared and you actually have too much serotonin. And if you don't clear some of these uh, 
these chemicals, particularly the exhaust fumes, uh, many of these we probably don't even begin to have an idea how detrimental they can be to our long-term or short-term health. So anything else that stands out in phase five, the acetylation and lipid synthesis that we should talk about before we move on to phase six? I think we pretty well covered that. Okay, awesome, cool. So phase six is heme. So let's talk a little bit about what is the heme cycle? What is heme? What, why is it important? Um, and what does it do for us? Sure. Firstly, I, uh, I want to give credit to many of the people who uh, to helped with this. Uh, this wasn't all the Bob Miller show here. I have some very excellent people that are that are helping out. Uh, Beth O'Hare is a, a naturopath in, uh, in, uh, in Cincinnati. She's the one who talked to me about the... Uh, the heme pathway. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Laurie Young from uh, North Carolina, who's you know part of this. Uh, Emily Givler. Uh, some of the stuff we're talking about uh, came from uh, from Dr. Mercola. I got to admit, some of this discussion came from when I heard uh, Dr. Neil Nathan speak about the uh, It's like that piqued my interest. And we owe a debt of gratitude to Stephanie Seneff. I believe you've had her on your show. Yep. Uh, so. What we've done, and on the K Rippy uh, is also a contributor. Emily Givler, my uh, one of the uh, nutritionists here, and uh, and actually even my son Matthew Miller, who's uh, uh, becoming somewhat of a uh, enthusiast in this. And you ought to see the text messages between the both of us; it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I named everybody there. So I just want to make sure everyone knows it's it's a it's a group effort. It's not just me figuring this all out. Uh, I maybe I'm the guy who's taking this data and you know putting the research together, but you know, standing on the shoulders of a lot of great people. And I just want to acknowledge, acknowledge them. Beautiful. So the, uh, when, when we were uh, teaching a class down in uh, Florida, Beth O'Hare came up and said, Bob, you really need to start looking at the heme pathway. And I thought, well, yeah, sure. Heme, hemoglobin, that's, that's probably important. But as I listened to her more, I realized that this is very significant. So what happens is uh, through the Krebs cycle, um, one of the pathways along there is succinyl COA. Now, I know we threw a lot of terms out, but we did speak earlier about how glutamate also gets broken down into alpha-ketoglutarate and succinyl COA. So succinyl COA is what feeds the heme cycle along with glycine, the amino acid. So glycine and succinyl COA are the beginning of what's called the heme cycle. Now, Stephanie Seneff has been uh, you know, very vocal in talking about, she strongly believes, that glyphosate or Roundup is impacting glycine. And of course, you know, like any scientific debate, you will see people who you know, are convinced that she's not correct on that. And you'll see people that says she is. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not enough of a biochemist to know if, uh, if glyphosate can truly impact glycine, but I, my, I lean towards, I think that she's gonna be proven to be correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna bet against her. <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> But I just want to point out there are some scientists who say nothing personal to her, but they just don't think that's happening. They're not debating the, the downside of glyphosate. Uh, they're just saying that they're not sure that process is. I, if I had to bet, I bet she's right. But just to be fair, I want to, want to state something as fact that it's still being debated. So if, if indeed glyphosate is being um, impacting the glycine, and then anything else is just impacting our ability to make energy, the very first step of the heme cycle is impaired. Now, what the heme cycle is, it's multiple steps, seven of them, and along the way, something called porphyrins are made. And the end result is that an enzyme called FETCH, F-E-C-H, takes iron and carefully attaches it so that it becomes the heme protein. Now, as you can imagine, let's go back to study number one, iron. We found that people with this susceptibility to just not being able to get well or absorbing more iron. They were getting it stuck inside the cells. The inflammation possibly wasn't uh, being tamped down by adequate uh, antioxidant production. But also, if something happens along this heme pathway, this iron doesn't get attached to heme either. And that iron, once again, has the potential to become a very strong free radical. Now, we tend to think of heme as, oh, that's hemoglobin. And again, this was pointed out to me by, uh, you know, by Beth and uh, and Shirley, her you know person who she worked with. And I was very stunned when they showed me that heme is needed for the SUOX enzyme. SUOX is what takes sulfites 
and turns it into sulfates. And that's why we just talked about acetylation. I want to bring this back to sulfation. So the SUOX enzyme is what takes sulfites and turns them into sulfates. But the heme protein is also responsible for catalase, one of the major enzymes we talked about that bleeds off the hydrogen peroxide. It's responsible for SOD. It's also responsible for nitric oxide, Nobel Prize in medicine in the 80s for nitric oxide. And I recently did some interviews with uh, Dr. Neil uh, Nathan, uh, Dr. Neil uh, Nathan Bryant, rather, and be one of the experts on uh, nitric oxide. And he believes that nitric oxide is also an electron donor, which hopefully we'll have a little time to get into electron donation. So this heme pathway is also responsible when it breaks down to make cytochrome P450 phase one liver detox. Okay, talk about significant. Now, after heme does its job, the heme protein does its job, there's an enzyme called HMOX, heme oxygenase. This has now drifted towards the top of one of the ones that I'm looking at as when it's variegated being the problem. Because once again, this heme protein has the, heme in, has the iron inside. If it breaks it down properly, the iron will be uh, transported into ferritin, which is the storage. So many times you'll see people that have genetic variants that they're overabsorbing iron, but yet their ferritin is very, very low. What we're observing early on, again, much more research has to be done on this, but when people have a lot of genetic variants in their HMOX genes, this is a pattern we often see. Inflammation going on, low ferritin, they're given iron, they feel worse. So I'm seeing this heme protein and this HMOX as being more critical than anything we've ever looked at. And I'm kind of stunned by all of this. Okay. What are some of the things that clinically would lead you to suspect someone may have an issue with heme? Are there some some key signs? Sure. Well, let's let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the sulfites and sulfates. Okay. You know, how many people are running around saying, "Oh, I can't do sulfur foods. Mm -hmm. I'm allergic to them." Okay. Well, when you when you look at the pathway, and if someone looks at our uh, at our map of uh, phase six, you'll see the pathway where you know, homocysteine comes down through transsulfuration, then also sulfur foods. And you get to a point where sulfites need to turn into sulfates. Sulfites are inflammatory because guess what they do? They stimulate the NOx enzyme that makes mast cells. And sulfites are also excitatory to the brain. Now in our office, uh, when everybody comes in for a nutritional consultation, we measure their sulfites and sulfates in their urine. And we many times see high sulfites, low sulfates. So let's talk about sulfates a little bit. And again, a lot of this information comes from Stephanie Seneff. I mean, hats off to her, you know, professor at MIT. We, whether glyphosate impacts, you know, that not, I mean, she's brought so much knowledge to us on sulfation. And I've learned a lot from her. And because of her work, uh, I really started looking at this sulfation. Mm -hmm. Sulfation is just like acetylation or methylation. We use it to get rid of some of our hormones that are excess. We use it to get rid of our excess catecholamines, the, the neurotransmitters. And many other xenobiotics come out through sulfation. And particularly the salt genes, the, you know, the sulfur transferase genes, again, take sulfate attached to excrete. So in sulfation, these toxins are excreted through the urine. So if your sulfites are not turned into sulfates, not only are you gonna have upregulation of inflammation, but you're potentially gonna have impaired sulfation, which again, is the removal of toxins. Now, let's look at estrogen. Estrogen stimulates histamine. Estrogen stimulates mTOR. Dopamine, and, and epinephrine and dopamine, your excitatory catecholamines. I, I tend to think uh, all you have to do is turn on the news for 10 minutes and you get the idea that people are a little more anxious and angry than they were 10 years ago. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, when you look at the autism, the ADD, the ADHD, everyone's uh, being angry. Uh, you could make an argument that a factor contributing to that is sulfation being impaired. And if indeed, you know, glyphosate is impacting that heme production and that is 
down-regulating your SUOX, you've got more inflammation from sulfites, less ability to clear the things that would be stimulatory. Then the sulfites, even among themselves, there's literature that they stimulate NOx, which stimulates mast cells. And thanks to the work of Dr. Thea Hardy, he firmly believes that mast cells are a contributing factor in autism because they overstimulate the hypothalamus. And could that be why we're seeing such anxiety among so many people? Uh, again, a, a potential that needs to be studied. But uh, the more I dig into this heme, the more I'm fascinated. And if somebody looks at the, uh, the poster, because I don't have the, the numbers memorized, significantly more genetic variants in multiple pathways of the heme pathway significantly more genetic variants in fetch significantly more genetic variants in hmox i'm surprised bob that you don't have them all memorized <laughs> <laughs> i just know they're they're 30 to 40 percent and higher. i do have it here fetch uh yeah i had noted 15 to 40 percent um from some of the the information you had talked about before so mm -hmm. so the heme piece again so um, bring that back to what people might express that gives you a clue so carbohydrates, is this an area where ketogenic diet maybe isn't ideal, cravings for certain things? Talk to us about those things that might sure. Well, one of the things that I'm finding fascinating is, remember we said we need succinyl COA and glycine to feed this pathway. Well, succinyl COA comes from the Krebs cycle. And if this pathway is impaired, again, just Bob Miller clinically observing, these are people that do horrible on ketogenic diet, and they're hungry all the time. I'll ask them, are you hangry? And they'll say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't get food, I get frustrated. Here's a potential reason why that might be happening. These porphyrins that go along the steps will block the GABA receptor sites. Whoa. So that's why they get hangry, because they need food. Now, the most, so being the curious person I am, I often ask, well, what is it you crave? Uh, one of the interesting favorites is ice cream. And ice cream is a nice source of sugar and glycine. Or they'll crave, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the monster drinks or the, uh, you know, those energy drinks, Red Bull. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll crave them. And, you know, it is such relief for some of these people because it's like, you know, what's wrong with me? Why don't I have self-control? You know, people beat up on them. Well, you just don't have self-control. And what a relief it is when you tell them, well, you know, it's not your fault. You are craving these because you're desperately trying to feed this heme pathway. And, uh, and that's why some people ketogenic, it's like, woohoo, this is the answer I've been looking for. And other people crash and burn. Because they need that constant supply of carbohydrates to feed that heme pathway. Because if they don't, not only do they block their GABA receptor sites, but they might be impacting their sulfite to sulfate. They may be impacting their ability to make nitric oxide. Oh, you ask clinically, you know, many times I ask people, do you have cold hands and feet? Oh, yeah, all the time. Men, 30 some years old, do you have erectile dysfunction? Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, because they don't have that that nitric oxide, and uh, nitric oxide is you know that enos is much needed for uh, the vasodilation, for proper uh, for proper blood flow. Uh, heme is a cofactor for NOS. Heme is a cofactor for SOD. Uh, heme is a cofactor for cytochrome P450 phase one. Maybe a cofactor for other things as well. So if if glyphosate is disrupting, if your mitochondria is not making uh, succinyl COA, which could even include high glutamate, because remember, glutamate goes down one of those pathways. Um, if you have genetic variants, that's, you know, we measured the genetic variants, uh, the heme pathway is disrupted. Uh, if you then combine that with somebody who's over absorbing iron to begin with. So what I'm finding is those that are really struggling have HFE variants, SLC40A1 variants, don't make antioxidants, disruption in the heme pathway, fetch genetic variants and HMOX genetic variants. They're burning up by those, that iron creating hydroxyl radicals through fentanyl. 
So let's talk a little bit more in your, what you're working on now, phase seven, the sulfation piece. So let's talk a little more about sulfites and sulfates. And there's that impaired conversion in some people from sulfite to sulfate. So am I understanding correctly that sulfate is actually a good thing, generally speaking? And if so, if we are not converting sulfite to sulfate, how do we add sulfates into our system? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I talk to some people and say, well, what do you think of Epsom salt baths? And they're like, oh, my God, I love them. <laughs> so, and uh, the, uh, the other thing we're looking at is, you know, I've, I've made a product called Suoxysis that has molybdenum, And molybdenum is a cofactor. But I found that if the heme is impaired enough, even molybdenum doesn't work. So some of the things we're going to be looking at that's in the research phase, and, and I, if you'd say to me, so, Bob, how do we get the heme cycle to work? I'd have to say, we're still working on that. Um, how do we make more heme? Still researching that. Uh, but there are ways to get uh, more sulfates in. There's uh, something called, uh, some people call it quintin, other people call it quinton water. Uh, it's the water that comes off the, uh, the coast of Spain. We measured in our office, and it has no sulfites and lots of sulfates. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way to get it in. Uh, I believe there are some, uh, some creams that you can actually put on the body that are Epsom salt uh, lotions. Yep. Yeah, and the ma magnesium the, sulfate lotion. Yeah, the magnesium the sulfate. sulfate, yeah. And with the Quinton, are you generally using the isotonic or the hypertonic? Uh, I've been using the, the 0.9. Nice. And just, okay. just to, be, to be mild. And I'm using that for people who uh, are sensitive to everything. And yeah. I tend to think, that you know, one of the things we've observed is when the heme cycle is disrupted, these are the people that they take an eighth of a capsule of anything and they come unglued. And I'll admit there was a time that I thought, really? You know, is, is this really happening? And and now I'm thinking, yeah, it, it really is. They're they're not just being melodramatic, they're not uh, you know overreacting, you know, they're not being hypochondriacs. Uh, they they really are. And which takes me back to, I wonder if these Quinton water, you know, is cofactors for some of the detoxification pathways. I am a huge fan of the Quinton water. I've used it myself for, for many years. And, and I actually am quite happy now that they sell it in liter size bottles rather than just the little glass things, which made it a little more expensive and a little more tedious for some people. So I think it's a, a phenomenal tool and it's interesting that you're seeing such good things. The, the other piece of that is I think that a lot of the reason that we have become toxic is because of a lack of trace minerals in our diet, in our soils, in our foods, and so on. So then the body tends to start holding on to more heavy metals and other things that are not ideal. And from my perspective, at least the Quinton is actually a good detoxification strategy because you're giving the body the things that it needs and preferentially would want to hold on to so that it can let go of some of those other toxins. Sure. You know, we, we tend to talk about, you know, genetic weakness, but you could have perfectly functioning genes. And if you don't have the cofactors that make it work, it's as if you had the genetic weakness. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the, uh, because of the over farming, the, uh, you know, our soils are depleted. I mean, even the government admits that we do not have the mineral levels that we did 50 to 75 years ago. Right. So we are getting minerally depleted. And again, so many people are worried about, do I have this genetic variant? You can have perfect genes. And if you don't have cofactors, you could be worse off than the person who does have the genetic variants, but does get the cofactors. So it becomes so multidimensional. So I have a couple other things that I want to jump into as we start wrapping up, but any, any other piece on the sulfite sulfate piece that you think we should. Talk yeah, about? Very significant. And this is where we're going to be going next. And your audience is going to be the first to hear it. So we talked about the, the NOx enzyme. So the NOx enzyme uh, stands for NADPH oxidase. Now I want to talk a little bit about going back to, uh, free radicals and antioxidants. Free radicals are missing an electron, antioxidants donate. After an antioxidant donates one time, it's done. It has to be recharged. There's a molecule called NADPH that recharges the, the, uh, the antioxidant so it can do it again. And we're not going to talk about it here, but one of our future studies is going to be looking at ways that we perhaps are not making enough NADPH. Uh, when you study the, uh, the anti-aging folks, there's a big emphasis on NAD+. 
NAD plus is what makes your NADH or NADPH and stimulates uh, CERT1 and CERT3, that is the CERT2ns, and that's another subject for another time. But I want to go back to the NADPH. So we need to make this NADPH to recycle your glutathione, recycle your thriodoxin. It's even needed in nitric oxide production. So I give the analogy, think of NADPH as the police officer in town who does really good stuff. However, when a robber comes in or has some invasion, the NOx enzyme says, uh, come over here a second, we have an enemy to fight. And what will happen is the uh, NADPH will move away from uh, uh, recycling your antioxidants to actually make free radicals, which again is a good thing. In studies where the NOx enzyme has completely knocked out, the animal dies for infection. So again, it's balanced. NOx is not bad. But NOx says, NADPH, I need you to come over here and I need you to make some free radicals to kill somebody. But the phrase that I'm trying to coin is the NADPH steel. And this is the first time I've used it anywhere, the NADPH steel, that the NADPH is being hijacked too much by these environmental factors. One being sulfites. Sulfites stimulate NOx. Low frequency EMF stimulates NOx. Homocysteine stimulates NOx. Excess iron stimulates NOx. mTOR stimulates NOx. So I'm putting out this theory, and that's all that it is. I'm not claiming this to be fact. I'm putting this out of the theory, and I'd love to do studies with some universities on this. And that is, are these environmental factors saying to NOx, we have an invisible enemy here that's really not there, and we're overstimulating the mast cells, and could this be why we're seeing such an overactivity of the mast cells. So maybe we don't have to just calm down the mast cells, but we need to get the sulfites converging into sulfates. We need to get the homocysteine down. We have to make the iron behave itself. We have to get the heme cycle making the heme so we make the antioxidants so we don't make more inflammation. So that's gonna be some of our future study. And I believe this is probably one of the most clinically significant things we found that NADPH is being stolen or you know, the NADPH steel to make free radicals that are maybe just a little bit over the top. This could be a reason why we're seeing overactivation of mast cells. And then if that NADPH is not available to recycle your glutathione, this thing feeds upon itself. You're creating more free radicals and you have less antioxidants. So that's the theory we're working under right now. What is the connection, if there is one, between NADPH and people that are starting to use things like NAD patches, NAD IVs, nicotinamide, riboside? What, what's the connection there? All right. Well, it's a big one uh, because the nicotinamide riboside is directly into your NAD+. And NAD+, will go one direction to make NADH, which is more energy-related. It'll go down another pathway where it gains an electron and becomes NADPH. And that's where you get your NADPH to recycle. But I think the reason there's such an interest in NAD+, and I'm very interested in this, this is an area we're going to be researching. It stimulates the sirtuins, which, if you look at the pathway, they are in, in control of autophagy. Uh, CERT3, uh, see if I have, I hope I have this right. Uh, CERT3 supports autophagy. CERT1 inhibits mTOR. Hmm. That's a big deal. Yeah. And both of them are responsible for uh, your, your catalase, your SOD. I think your CERT1 is responsible for your vitamin D receptor site. And, uh, and CERT3 is also responsible for urea, stimulating the urea cycle to clear ammonia. So that's why and the people who are doing anti-aging are looking at NAD+. Now, the other thing is NAD+, also feeds what's called the PARP enzymes, which is DNA repair. Real quick mention in study number six, we also showed more genetic variants in the genes that would be responsible for DNA repair. So is this a something that feeds upon itself that as the as the pathogen you know hurts the uh, hurts the cells in the DNA, do we have less than optimal DNA repair? Uh, one other one we found was the dark gene, DARC, which is related to uh, malaria, which is quite fascinating. So so much to learn here. But back to the NAD. So if your NAD is being depleted, 
because you're trying to repair cells, you've got less NADPH. That leads to more inflammation. Potentially, that leads to more NOx upregulation, and this thing just feeds upon itself. Again, theory. I'd uh, love to study it. Love to have a university come and say, Bob, let's look at this some more closely. But when you look at the literature, I think we're connecting dots. I mean, we did not make up what stimulates, you know. So everything we've, we've said is based on my charts. I have, you know, literature that, uh, that backs it up. You know, and I, I'm interested as well. We talked briefly about the dark um, genes, D-A-R-C, for those listening, um, and the connection to malaria. And immediately my mind wondered, well, malaria and Babesia are very similar organisms. And so do people that have variants in those dark genes potentially then have some uh, bigger issues when they get exposed to Babesia, for example. And I, I can already see from you shaking your head, that's something that you're looking at and interested yeah. in as well. Absolutely. <laughs> So with everything that you know from phases one through seven, and it's interesting as we start talking in this conversation, it becomes even clearer that they're, they're all interconnected. But if you could, you know, you were on an island somewhere and you could only have three nutrients that were going to support your clients or you with these genetic variants that you commonly see, which three would be the ones that stood out to you as the most potentially important? Sure. Well, probably Hinocchio to support the glutamate to GABA conversion. Uh, probably something that uh, calms down histamine, like a quercetin. Uh, I'm becoming a big fan of, uh, of apigenin uh, mm -hmm. because that also calms it down. And, uh, you know, probably something like a skull cap or alpha lipoic acid to just keep the iron in check. Pantothene didn't make your list. Well, yes, but you only gave me three of them. <laughs> 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 Beautiful. That was great. Can I go to four? Then I'd add panathene. Uh, you bet. You can go as many as you need. So I just wanted to bring people up to speed. So at one point, your software practitioners using your software could take 23andMe and run that through. Um, about two years ago, probably now, 23andMe stopped reporting a number of the key functional medicine related variants that are relevant to the work that you're doing and to people with chronic Lyme, for example. So tell us a little bit about what you've done in terms of developing a new chip and the types of things that you're looking at and the fact that now people can get that saliva-based testing done directly through your practitioners and your office. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. As you said, uh, we, we really uh, were quite surprised. One day we went to put a 23andMe in and all of a sudden it's like, where did all the SNPs go? Uh, so I decided, well, I'm either out of business or I'm going to keep going. So I took a deep breath and said, I'm either going to do okay or eat dog food in retirement. And I... <laughs> And I uh, contracted with Thermo Fisher to make my own custom chip, where I put many of those functional SNPs back in, plus others that 23andMe didn't have. And then we uh, we partnered with uh, Brooks at Rutgers to, to run the data. And then I have my own software called Functional Genomic Analysis that takes that information and we make massive reports. You know, this isn't just 25 to 35 top SNPs that are proven. You know, we're looking at Lots of them that nobody even knows about yet, but we have them there for, for research purposes. Uh, now, for your listeners, this is unfortunately only available through health professionals. We don't sell to the public. This is not like do your 23andMe, do genetic gene or live well. We only work with health professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, you, if you go to the website that's listed on your, no, your genomic resource, there's lists of doctors across the country who use the software. And the health professional would order the genetic test for the individual. Uh, they would get it sent to them. They'd give their saliva. It would be run and go into the software. Then they'd do a consult with their, their health professional. And if someone's watching this who is a health professional, we also have online certification courses. And as we mentioned, in September of, of, uh, of 2019, we're going to be in Denver, Colorado for environmental toxicity. And middle of November, back in Hershey, Pennsylvania, for our second annual, we had our, we just had our first annual, which was a smashing success. Awesome. Uh, second annual uh, genomic conference, possibly on neurotransmitters. Not sure, but it's where we're leaning. So if people, they can go to the website, find practitioners that are doing this and get access to this uh, genetic testing and reporting. If they wanted to work just directly with you and your team, my understanding is they can also reach out through the TOL Health or treeoflifehealth.com site okay. and access that same service through you yes. or mm -hmm. someone on your staff, correct? Sure, of course. 
Um, and of course, there's you know so many people in need. We can't begin to handle everybody. That's why we train everyone. But yes, we do. We, I still see clients on a regular basis. You know, I always tell everybody we're we're not a medical facility. We're not medical doctors. We don't diagnose, treat, prescribe. We're we're kind of like health coaches that help determine based upon your genome uh, where you may have some nutritional weakness. I often say I'm one of the busiest practitioners who sees people with Lyme who does not treat Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. We we are cleaning up the terrain. So we have physicians all over the world send people to us because they try to give them antibiotics or even herbals and they herx on it. So we're the cleanup crew, so to speak, to the, you know, the, clean the autophagy people. side of the house. <laughs> <laughs> and the acetylation and the mast cell and the sulfation and all those kind of things. So I ask this question of every guest. So what are some of the key things that you personally do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Sure. Well, I uh, personally have, uh, you know, weakness in my sulfation. So I do the ketone water. Uh, I, uh, I'm starting to begin the process of uh, supporting my heme cycle. Uh, and I found out that I'm a, you know, a poor sulfator. And uh, so I put, uh, you know, I, I soak my feet in Epsom salt sometimes when I'm here at the office and put on the, uh, the, the lotion. Also doing uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, MSM. Uh, if I'm uh, meeting sometime, I'll have a little bit more broccoli, a little bit more cruciferous vegetables. Uh, I also have tremendous weakness in my nerve too. So I'll take nerve two accelerator one to two days a week. <clears throat> I'll take autophagy assist, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Most days I have something to eat at 12 o'clock. Every, every once in a while, it's like, that's eh, not working today. And I don't fight it. But I try to limit my eating from 12 to 8 p.m. Not every day. If I'm traveling, if I'm at a conference and they have breakfast, they're like, okay, it's cheat day. So I'm not, uh, you know, it's like I always eat eight hours. Uh, but I'd say probably seven out of 10 days, I'll, my food is in an eight hour period. Beautiful. Yeah, I love your passion for this. You definitely are continuing to be excited about research, figuring out more pieces of the puzzle. It's kind of funny. We were just at the ILADS conference in Chicago, um, had been you know involved in the event for 10 or 12 hours probably, and I happened to run into Bob, and I was just ready to go to dinner, call it a day, recharge, and you said, I'm going to go back to my room and work on my charts. <laughs> <laughs> So I, uh, I love it. I love that you're that excited about finding solutions for people. I think this work is important. And, and it's really rewarding to do something that minim minimizes the struggle or suffering that someone else has and helps them to regain their optimal health. So I honor you for your work. And I'm excited to continue to see it evolve and know that uh, big things are already happening and bigger things to come. Absolutely. And again, Scott, uh, you are doing a phenomenal job at bringing this information to folks. Uh, you really do your, your, you do your homework. Uh, and uh, I can see you have that ex same passion as well. Knowing a little bit about you personally that, uh, that you uh, decided to dedicate your life to helping others. And you're right. When, when you give hope to people, uh, it's priceless. It, it really is. I can't think of anything more exciting than when somebody's sitting here and you can say, well, you know, this doesn't look this like it's too hard to figure out. And they say, it's not. No, it's not, you know, and you can just see the relief on their face that, uh, you know, they're, they're not a mystery. They're, uh, you know, they're not defective. You know, some of the terms that are thrown out there, sometimes they think genetic defects. And it's like, well, I tell people, no, you're not defective. You have a little weakness uh, here. Well, one final thing. We, I, I know you had uh, Dr. Neil Nathan on in his book, Toxic. Uh, one of the chapters in the book is, uh, was written by me and my son, where we go through some of these basics. So if uh, someone would like to hear some basics on, you know, iron oxidation, SOD, and glutathione, uh, Dr. Nathan was so gracious to allow me to uh, put a chapter in there. So a little education there. And again, for health professionals, we have a certification course. We have live courses to try to get uh, doctors up to speed. We're working with functional medicine doctors, dentists, psychiatrists, uh, acupuncturists, chiropractors, nutritionists, uh, to try to crack this code, because the thing we keep hearing over and over again, uh, the future is going to be personalized care. One size does not fit all. Absolutely. And what works for one person can be a disaster for the next. And if we can get a little peek under the hood to see, you know, potentially that, for example, for some folks, it's like, you know, hydrogen peroxide therapy may not be a good idea for you because it cures some people, makes some people really sick. Right. 
Right. And if we, if we can identify that ahead of time, uh, we might be able to not only help people get well, but not do some damage that inadvertently happens from time to time. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Bob. I am sure that we will do this again as your work continues to evolve. And I just thank you so much for your work and honor you for everything that you're doing. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Always a lot of fun, buddy. Thanks so much. Be well. My pleasure. To learn more about today's guest, visit NutriGeneticResearch.org or TOLHealth.com. That's Nutri, N-U-T-R-I, GeneticResearch.org or Tree of Life at TOLHealth.com. NutriGeneticResearch.org or TOLHealth.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit BetterHealthGuy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.